Welcome back to Live With, brought to you by Yamamoto Nutrition. I'm Dave Palumbo, and today's guest of the evening is Bill Llewellyn, the author of the Anabolics book series, the creator of Roy Test, and the, uh, also the creator of X Factor, uh, I guess you could call it essential fatty acid supplement. So Bill, uh, we've been friends a long time, we've known each other, I, I've been wanting to get you back, we got a lot of good stuff to talk about. Um, you're probably most well known, I would say, for the Anabolics book series, especially, um, I mean, that's going back, I, I don't even know how many years, what was, what was the first year you wrote that book? 2000. Wow. So that was uh, quite a while ago, and uh, you have a new edition coming out, which we haven't seen for quite a while. Tell us a little bit about how that whole book series got started, what, what was the impetus for you writing the book series, and, and how many editions have we seen so far over the years? Um, well, this will be the eighth, and, and thanks for having me on, by the way. I always, uh, always have a good time talking to you. Um, so this will be the eighth uh, update to the book, the eighth edition. Uh, first one was in 2000, so it's been, uh, it's been some time. I think what what prompted me to start writing this is I, I started building a website. I was collecting pictures of different drug products and stuff and, and putting profiles together. And I, I found myself referencing uh, popular uh, steroid, you know, steroid materials uh, that were out there. Um, and as my knowledge on the subject evolved, I would find myself correcting the popular books like, oh, you know, this isn't correct. This isn't correct. Uh, this needs to be you know, changed. So at some point, it dawned on me that I could put a pretty good book together that would correct a lot of the inaccuracies that I was noticing in the, uh, the data before. And also, to, which sort of works in my favor, is this uh, crazy abundant availability of scientific information that happened with the, uh, you know, with the spread of the Internet. So I think a lot of the books that came before my time, um, the authors didn't have the benefit of such easy access to research. So you know, here I was you know, looking into the different subjects, finding a lot of inaccuracies, and just decided to put together uh, my own book, and it grew from there. You're kind of like, you called, kind of followed in the footsteps, I guess you could say, of, of um, Bill Phillips, who did the first anabolic reference guide. I'm sure you read that book 600 times like I did back sure. in the day. And then he went to the supplement guide. You also had a supplement guide. So, you know, I, I, I kind of mirror his, uh, you know, his media aspect, you know, with RX Muscle and then my supplement company. But... Uh, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people just kind of had that anecdotal gym, you know, information prior to, like, Phillips. Uh, I remember I read that book and had it memorized. Uh, you kind of took it one step further, though. You really expanded quite a bit over what Phillips had originally done and made it way, way more detailed. It's almost like a, um, I would dare I say, the encyclopedia of steroids. I mean, you, you got everything in there. It's almost... You can't read the book on the toilet. It's like you got to almost read it in little sections by your interest level. Um, that takes a lot of time. You, you basically wrote a textbook. How the mm -hmm. heck did you sit down and, and, and discipline yourself enough to do that? Um, I don't know exactly what the, uh, the definition of it, uh, if I do have uh, something, but um, I assume it's probably something along the lines of obsessive compulsive disorder or something. <laughs> I get deeply focused on a subject. You can't make me get focused on a subject I don't want to. Unfortunately, I'd probably be doing other things, uh, get into stock trading or something, but I have to be really interested in it. But if I am, I'm obsessive about it. And uh, I just clicked uh, at a particular time in my life with anabolic steroids and that's all I would do, read, write, read, write. I would spend the whole day at a medical library pulling, uh, you know, pulling studies. And um, for me, when I'm just really interested in something, I'm voracious about studying it, uh, absorbing information, um, and then putting information together and disseminating it was, it's, it's along the similar lines. You know, I, I love doing it when it's something that I'm really excited about. Now, back in the day when you first got fascinated by anabolic steroids, as we all did, were you a user of them? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So you tried everything, pretty much. So, Because a lot of people think, wow, Bill just writes about it, but he doesn't really know about it. But I know you used the stuff back in the day. So you, you've experienced what it feels like to use these compounds. Yeah, without a doubt. I've used most steroids. There's a couple that I hadn't, uh, hadn't been able to get my hands on over the years, but... Um, for the most part, yeah, I've, I've used the vast majority of the compounds. I was on gear a lot. I, look, I'm always a small guy. First off, you know, I'm a nerd. I'm a nerdy, thin dude. That's, that's who I am. <laughs> One of the things that attracted me to steroids in the first place is that I was a real skinny kid in high school. 
Uh, I was like 130 pounds my senior year. Wow. I was working out. I was working out with friends. They were making progress. I always struggled for it. I have, I just have that kind of genetic frame. When I don't train, I lose muscle mass. I lose weight. I get skinny. Um, and that attracted me to them in the first place. And uh, yeah, I used them a lot over the years. I was never massive. I, I think at my heaviest, I was probably 185. The most weight I ever benched up, you know, put off my chest without anybody touching it was 315 for a couple reps. But I was proud. He was what, proud about what I did for a skinny dork. I did all right. <laughs> well, I, I love the book, and I, and I, and I agree with 99% of what you've written in there. With you know. I, I think it's very well researched and I think there's a lot of good documented uh, information. So people are looking for a book that's going to help instruct them. Because always, people always email me questions and then they say, is there anything I can read you know, for this stuff? I said, well, you know what, I don't have the patience to sit down and write a book. I wish I did. But the best book out there, I said, is, and really the only book that has any you know, real science behind it is, is Bill Llewellyn's book, Anabolics. And um, you know, up till recently, you know, I figured, you know what? At, you did all you can do. There's nothing that more that can be done. So I figured that was the end of it. But now you decided to update it recently. What, what's in the new update? What could you possibly add? Did you add like a new classes of drugs that are out available now, like peptides? What, what, what have you added to this book? So yeah, that- I mean, you, you, you made a very good point. You know, seven, it's been seven years since I updated the book. Um, and at that point, you know, for a few updates before that, I was slowly going back, reworking my material, um, trying to get it to where I wanted it to be. Um, when I did the 10th edition, everything was where I wanted it to be. I figured I might be done with the book. I wasn't sure if I would ever do an update again. Um, but you know, our field has evolved a lot, uh, since then. Um, and you're exactly right. The steroids were not extensively expanded, a little bits of information here or there, but these are all drugs. Um, what we put most of our emphasis on this time are the, the peptides, the SARMs, and some of the other new investigational drugs that are out there that are, you know, becoming... Uh, more and more popular. I, I could not include them all. There's so many new drugs out there and peptides that uh, I would have to put a whole other anabolics edition to cover them all. But I, I believe I um, covered the most popular agents, the most important ones, and certainly the ones um, I think that have the most uh, you know, most data behind them and the most substance behind them. Do you think those pep- the peptides work? I think they do, um, depending on what you're trying to get out of it. I think a lot of people want to replicate what anabolic steroids do and with, with other drugs. And you just, you don't get that. You get close sometimes, you can get, um, you know, substantive benefits. Uh, but, you know, even the SARMs, which mimic the effects of anabolic steroids a lot, they're, you know, they're, they're close, but some, a lot of them are close, or some of them, I shouldn't say, not a whole lot of them out there. Some of them are close, but they're nothing in my mind, my opinion. Nothing is replaced as unseed anabolic steroids as the primary most effective muscle builder. So if that's what you're looking for, then I think you're going to be disappointed. But if you're looking for drugs that have anabolic effect, have performance enhancing effect, um, maybe could augment um, anabolic steroids or be an alternative when you don't choose to use anabolic steroids, um, then yeah, a, a lot of these compounds, not all of them, but a lot of these compounds do offer some, some benefit, some value. People always ask me this question, so I'm going to ask it to you. What do you think is the most powerful anabolic agent available to use in your estimation? You know, it's tough to say. I think the, the most powerful steroid is dimethyl trianolone. I believe that's ever been assay, um, which is a, a, a second methylation on uh, trenbolone. It's, it's a crazy, um, potent, super resistant uh, steroid for, for breakdown metabolism. Um, that's probably the strongest. You know, when you turn in terms of relative effectiveness, that's it's always going to depend on you know what you're using it, who's using it, what dosage you're taking. Um, I still believe testosterone and trenbolone are really um, backbone anabolics. With orals, nothing holds a candle to anadrol. As far as the common drugs, I could split hairs and go into research and say, oh, you know, this was the uh, strongest binding and prop, but. Those are the drugs to me. Testosterone, Trenbolone, Anadrol, those are, are the three three real top of the heap. Uh, and I would agree with that statement 100%. What was the drug you mentioned, the first drug? I, I didn't even know what it was, the, the, tri, the dimethyl one? Yeah, it's dimethyl trienolone. Uh, what it is is, um, well, first you have Trenbolone, which we already know right. is a very strong steroid. It's very resistant to metabolism. It's, uh, 
it, it's pretty potent already. So then you have methyl trialon, which is essentially what they did with boldenone to debol. You methylate it, you make it orally active, but it changes the character of the steroids. So now you have methyl trialon, which they use in cell incubation studies a lot because it's really, really strong binder of the antigen receptor. Now, dimethyl trianol, they put another methyl group on that, which further protects it from breakdown, seemingly, and uh, increases its bind, it de decreases its binding, sorry, to, uh, to binding proteins. So it's like a super uh, methyl trianolone, which is a super trenbolone. So it's like, it's a crazy potent compound. And by the way, methyl trianolone was the most potent, most liver toxic drug, that, uh, steroid that was ever tested in humans. Uh, it's, it produced significant liver toxicity in less than a milligram a day. So we're talking microgram doses. And that's not even dimethyl trianolone. So DMTs are really interesting uh, steroid from a is structural. It, so it's an, it's an oral compound is what it is. That's why they have it, a methyl group yeah, on it. definitely very orally active. Right. And it has tremendous, um, obviously, toxicity issues. Now, was this one of the steroids that was being sold, obviously, as a, quote, pro-hormone for a while? Not that one. Not specifically dimethyl trianolone, but it has been on the underground market. Um, I have to double check. I might have even put a profile on it. Uh, it's not very big. It's not big out there, but a couple of uh, it, it will be now. Bill. It will be it. now. Everyone's going to want to use this now because you just basically have said this is the most. People don't care about toxicity yet. Who are watching the show? I know Boston Lloyd's probably writing the name down right now, and he's he's calling his local uh, dealer to try to get some of this stuff. Uh, but you wouldn't suggest you wouldn't recommend taking it. It sounds like it's, it it is a little too toxic for the liver. You know, I like mitigating risk. So when it comes to, to all of these anabolic drugs, whether you're talking about steroids or uh, growth hormone-related stuff, peptides, SARMs, um, there's so many things to choose from. And some drugs have really good safety data behind them. Human studies have been through trials. Not everyone's an approved drug, but you still have a lot of data to draw from sometimes. Right. Uh, like right. even in the SARMs, you know, they're, they're not a, you don't have an approved SARM yet, but we have uh, drugs that have been in through phase one, phase through clinical. So I like mitigating risk by going with drugs that have some safety uh, yeah. data behind it. Yeah. DMT does not. <laughs> uh, when I say uh, methyl trianolone was the most liver toxic steroid, that, that was tested. DMT was not tested in humans. It probably is more liver toxic. Right. Uh, we just don't know. We don't know much about it in humans because it's just never been studied. Right. What about the new uh, myostatin inhibitors that are out there? I always tell everyone that they're a crock of shit. I, don't, I haven't seen anyone get any results from them. It, you know, myostatin, just for those who don't know, is a, uh, a protein that inhibits muscle growth. And, you know, so the, the holy grail is can we block myostatin in, in humans to create more muscle or unlock more muscle growth? Has that been accomplished anywhere? You know, it's, they are doing that in for lack of a better term, gene doping experiments where they, they change the, um, the output of myostatin or folostatin in animals. You know, I didn't even include, folostatin is the big one right now when you talk about, um, about these drugs. And I didn't even include a profile of that in the book this year. I, I tried to, but when I really dug into it, there's, there's not much of substance there. What you have is um, labs that have duplicated folostatin, which in theory, would be, uh, you know, would be a benefit, but they are ref you're referencing studies that involve, uh, you know, mice that have been, um, you know, altered. So they overexpress folostatin or, or in some other way they're introducing this. Um, and then they're using that to reference the effects of just recombinant folostatin in humans, which is very short acting. There's no clinical studies on it. There's, I can find very little data in that area. So what I would say is right now, no, there's nothing on the radar that I'm saying like, yeah, there's real substantive uh, information here. There's probably a drug that's going to come out of this. Mm -hmm. um, down the road, look, this is, seems like a viable avenue for research without a doubt. Down the road, I think um, we, we will see something in this area. Right now, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, do you know of any people like maybe over in Europe, because I know they're a little more progressive, that, that are doing gene doping on humans where they're actually putting it in vector viruses where, they'll, where they change the expression of certain genes, products? Is that Because uh, we, we heard about that 10 years ago it was going to happen and kind of no one's been talking about it. No, personally, no. I'm less and less in the past you know, decade or so. Um, I've been, I mean, I'm still well connected with, with 
people in the sports community and people that are involved in doping, but not so ingrained in that community where I think that, um, you know, I'd be at that level of uh, relationships. Uh, that's, that's still, I think, still pretty advanced um, level of doping um, if it is uh, being, you know, taking place. Yeah. When you see, uh, I don't know if you follow the what's going on at Oxygen Gym out there in Kuwait. Uh, Beta Badai has like a you know built a, a mecca for bodybuilders out there where they go out there and they train and they eat and stay out there and you know get all their supplements for free and 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 you know it's just a it's a great environment for for building muscle. And these guys seem to be getting bigger. And uh, do you think there's anything any hokey pokey going on out there with special new drugs that we don't know about? That's what a lot of people think or suspect. I don't believe that. I, I think it's the environment they're in. What's your uh, What's your opinion on that? I can't speak to uh, to to Kuwait. I don't know a lot about uh, what's going on there uh, specifically. But you know, if if you asked me that question ten or fifteen years ago, I would say you know uh, it's pretty doubtful. I, I'd still say it's probably unlikely that anybody's unlocked. A big secret but at the same time you have to acknowledge the speed at which new drugs are getting recognized within the sports community um, and being brought to market um, you could go through research books right now I mean I, I could find something today that seems interesting whether or not it's viable to synthesize or not I don't you know would depend on the situation but I could find something today that seems really interesting I could contact a lab and in a matter of weeks I could have probably a sample of that uh, to, to fiddle with so <laughs> It's possible. Bodybuilding and sports doping are the two areas where there's a lot of progress when it comes to understanding these new uh, anabolic and performance enhancing drugs. Uh, many times we're ahead of the, uh, the medical community in that regard. So it's possible. There's a lot happening right now. It's, yep. it's, it's an interesting time to be in this field because um, so much is changing. Yeah, they should. They, I, I thought maybe they kidnapped Patrick Arnold and took him out there and uh, have him working in a back room or something like well, that. That, yeah. that would be a good idea. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a brain you'd want to get under lock if you could. Um, what did I want to ask you? I had another question I wanted to ask you. Oh, what do you, what do you think about the use of stem cells? Now that stem cells is being used for all this injury you know, repairs, joints and this and everything stem cells. They even want to put it in your hair, grow new hair. Do you think stem cells could be a... Um, uh, a, can be used for performance enhancing uh, purposes at some point? You know, this is a very interesting field. Um, unfortunately, one that I have not uh, devoted a lot of time to. Um, as far as on the performance enhancing radar, it's, uh, it's, not, really, it's not really on mine right now. Um, but it, it's a very interesting area of medicine. So um, I won't comment on the possibilities, uh, except to say that uh, I really uh, am eager to see that explored more. Too. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, let's face it. We know that IGF-1 and uh, growth hormone activate, you know, satellite, dormant satellite cells inside, or stem cells as they, they, we call them now, inside muscle tissue. I mean, I wonder what would happen if you're injecting stem cells into, into muscle tissue. I mean, no one's really talked about that, or I don't even know if anyone's even tried it. I haven't uh, I haven't heard of that, but that would be uh, interesting. Yeah, people people forget. You know, we we focus on muscle growth so much about protein, protein synthesis, protein synthesis. But the reality is, especially when it comes to continued, you know, ongoing growth, protein synthesis is is one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is myonuclear density. How many nuclei you have in right. your muscle cells? Muscle cells are very unique, as you know. I'm, I'm, I know I'm talking to uh, preaching to the choir. You know this stuff. Um, no one else does. Muscle fibers are unique in the body. They get enormously big compared to other cells. But the um, the caveat to that is, in order for them to be able to be functional cells at that size, they have to be multinucleated. They have to have a lot of nuclei in them because it has to be efficient. Um, transferring messages, um, you know, between receptors and nuclei and getting things transcribed, it can't be a slow, long, arduous process for. Um, for components to find each other, the cell then becomes inefficient. So backbone to ongoing hypertrophy is the incorporation of new nuclei. And um, that's a big fundamental to my work in arachidonic acid, which I know we're going to talk about um, in a minute. Um, but certainly very important and should not focus just on the, uh, the, fo uh, the part of protein synthesis. From what I understand from Dr. Scott Conley, who I've had on the show many, many times in the past, he, he says that the multi-nucleated muscle cells and the in increase in, in nuclei in the cells is really what we call muscle memory. 
because when the a muscle cell atrophies, you don't lose those nuclei. So when you go back to the gym and you start re-stimulating the muscles, those nuclei have memory. That's what has the memory essentially in the cells enlarge quickly. Would you That's exactly, that? you know, it's, you, you, you bring up a, an interesting point to me. Years ago, I, was say, I said to myself, when I was really getting a, a landscape on how the, the, the process of muscle, and I don't claim to understand everything fully, it's such a complicated system. Um, but when I started to really grasp uh, the role of uh, nuclear density uh, and what have you, um, I started to, to say to myself, well, we bring these nuclei into the cell. We train hard, we work hard, um, we're expanding growth capacity with this. What happens when we detrain? I said, I'll bet you that the greater nuclear density sticks around your cells and that's why you have muscle memory. And sure enough, several years after that, there was a study that showed detraining, you retain that density. Right. And what you have in there is you have a muscle cell that's more efficient. It's a lot easier, uh, signaling can get done more quickly, more efficiently with that extra density. So regrowth and uh, you know getting back to your, your previous state is much more quickly accomplished, and that's that's key to it. Yeah, I mean, Lever Kevin Lavroni probably has more muscle density to his muscle cells than any human being on the planet because that guy recovers. I mean, can gain back muscle faster than anyone, even at 52 years of age. Let's talk uh, about peptide hormones or protein hormones. What would you say is the most powerful protein hormone out there? You know, and we'll include growth hormone, IGF one, all the, all those in, in that list. Well, you know, first. I like GH the most. Um, IGF-1 conceivably, in theory at least, uh, could be a little more potent. In terms of potency, those allow you to surpass your natural hormone levels far more substantially, if you wish to, than you can with, say, the GHRPs, the GHRH drugs, um, which rely on your body's own synthesizing capacity. Now. I also like those drugs too. They're much more cost effective in the GH realm than, you know, somatropin. Um, they are often uh, very effective for raising GH. You can get them to um, super physiological levels, but um, in terms of being what you know, what's more potentially effective, GH, IGF-1, probably of those, um, but also more side effect prone. I like the GHRPs, the GHRHs, you know, kind of um, because you can get some benefit out of them. They're more cost effective and uh, less prone to side effects than, um, you know, than people taking, uh, taking growth hormone, generally speaking. But again, I'm more, I'm 43. I'm more about, uh, you know, mitigating risk, especially at, at this point in my life. So, sure. Now, what is your feeling about insulin? I've made it known that, you know, I don't really believe insulin is a muscle building hormone. I think it's more of a, you know, blood sugar control hormone, which is obviously important because you want to have the, cell, the cells be fed. But I don't think that these guys taking these super physiological levels of insulin are really doing anything for muscle growth. W what is your feeling on that? You know, I've seen people dramatically increase in size on insulin. Um, you know, how, how effective it is in the, in the grand scheme for um, as just an anabolic, just in solid muscle tissue, I can't say, but I, I do think it's made a difference. Um, I think it helps, it does help people load in nutrients more. Um, it's tough to say. I never see people use insulin really in isolation either. Mm -hmm. you know, they're always using it with a bunch of other things. But I, I do think it can augment growth. It has other issues too, and it can augment fat gain and you know, some other, uh, you know, some other things which may not always uh, be appropriate, but. Um, is it the be all end all? Has it changed the, the landscape completely? I'm not going to go that far. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Let's talk about another one of your great inventions, which I constantly praise you for the invention of Roid Test, which is a, a steroid, <laughs> just, it's not a peptide, it's a steroid testing kit, which basically tests for pretty much all the known anabolic steroids out there. Um, I'm one of your distributors. I sell it at DavePalumbo.com. I sell a ton of these kits because people nowadays can't trust the drugs that are on the market. It's not like the old days. Is it counterfeit or real? It's a matter of who made it, basically, and what are they putting in there, and uh, is, it, is it actually what they're supposed to be putting in there? So you came up with this, these testing kits that are ingenious. I mean, you just basically put a little a drop of, uh, of anabolic into these vials, 
depending on you know what compound it is it depends on what vials you pick and then you just match it up on the color chart basically and you can tell which drug it is or you can confirm if it is indeed the drug you think you're testing brilliant brilliant idea how long did that come take to come about and uh, where did you get the idea to come up with this kit well first off i i love roy test uh, i'll start off by saying that i great name um, too for so long you know i used to I used to sit there, and in my anabolics book, um, you could see, I, I would sit there with a microscope looking at, at pharmaceutical packaging, comparing it to uh, copies. I would spend so much time and energy trying to help people steer clear of counterfeits and, and junk products. And it's been something, I think that's been one of the, uh, the core issues for me. It's been the, the counterfeit market out there. Um, so, and I'm not going to take all the credit at all for, um, for Roy Test. This is really what happened with it. Um, this technology for presumptive identification, uh, identification of, of drugs with reagents, it's an old technology that's widely used in law enforcement, customs and stuff for, um, for exactly this with other illicit drugs. Um, about, I want to say it was close to 10 years ago, um, was working, uh, did some work in, um, in Holland trying to develop this type of system, working with um, standard reagents and playing around with them with different drugs. Um, we did some early work on it. It was encouraging, but also realized we're talking about two dozen plus different anabolic steroid substances. They're all close, closely related. And I needed to do a lot of hands-on work with them. And I'm in the US, I, can't, I don't have access to these drugs. So the project that we started years back died off. We did some work with uh, somebody else, but uh, it, it never uh, evolved. So now fast forward to 2015. I was in uh, Amsterdam working on, uh, on another project, and we actually got a, a call from, from a company that does this, that made this technology for anabolic steroids. Um, they reached out to me for another issue, but I was like, holy shit, somebody did it. So went to see the guys, uh, talked to them, eventually worked out an exclusive relationship with them. Um, what we, what I can take credit for, what our group will take credit for, um, is that we have worked them, with them to refine the technology. Um, we noticed some things very quickly on that could be improved. I think we brought a well-needed, um, I'd say, street element um, to the technology. I think when, um, when you're in a lab, you're very focused on the compounds and the testing and the results, but you may not have the understanding of, um, you know, hey, um, Winstrol is often used as a substitute for Anavar. You know, you got to look at these two drugs together. You got to make sure you can differentiate them. That kind of thing, um, we brought a lot to the table. Since we've uh, since we started working to them, uh, we've got a new reagent. We dumped another reagent. We've really tightened up the uh, the kit to to where it's really solid right now. Um, obviously, it's not a substitute for lab analysis, but it's it's fucking damn good right now. And I'm really happy that we can be part of something that, geez, for a change after decades of, of really just being at the mercy of counterfeiters and, uh, and people producing products, you have something right now that you can actually look at it and say, you know, what the hell is in this? Is it actually what's on the label? Well, as soon as I saw it, I called you immediately. You know that. I, I was like probably the first person on the phone with you. I said, I yeah. have to sell these because I... People drive me crazy day and night asking me if stuff is real. And now, when I work with clients or people asking questions, I just say, here's the link on my website. Buy these kits. They're very reasonably priced. For the prices that people pay for anabolic steroids, it's a joke almost. If you don't test your stuff, you're almost, you're almost, it's almost like you deserve to have fake stuff because it's so simple. Conf confirm that your stuff is good, and then and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Now the only drawback be between uh, with the Roy test is that you can't really tell what the dosage of things is in there, but at yeah. least you know you're using the right drug. Like if you're a woman taking Anavar, you don't want to be taking Dianabol, you know, because someone thought it was it was a great idea to put you know Dianabol in there because it's cheaper and it'll make people think the drug is stronger. So I think it it, it has a tremendous place in every person who uses any anabolics. Uh, back pocket. If you don't use this technology, you are a dummy. Okay. Uh, so having said that, it's a brilliant invention because no one else had ever thought of this before. And the packaging is so tremendously great with the name Roy Test 
and it's easy to understand. You know, I made some videos explaining to people how to use it. It's, it's brilliant. I got to take my hat off to you. I wish I came up with it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, hey, I wish we could take full credit, but um, we worked hard with the, uh, with the company to, um, to bring it to where it is uh, today. And yeah, so very proud of it. Thank you. And you touched on something that's super important that a lot of people don't realize. That's what makes uh, steroids really um, a, a prime target for people that are looking to exploit the consumer because the drugs, they act often in a very similar manner to each other, but they can be vastly different in price. And I'll give you some extremes. Um, you could have D-ball, maybe a thousand bucks a kilo. You could have halotestin at 40,000 bucks a kilo. Wow. So what do you think the chance is that an underground dealer is spending 40 grand on a kilo for halotestin instead of putting or maybe a wind straw in there or something like that. And how many people really have the experience to tell the difference between an effective dose of wind straw, an anabolically effective dose of that, and a dose of halitestin? Right. Some do, most don't. They're gonna take the product, they're gonna get results from it, and they're gonna be like, oh, that was great. <laughs> and that's why people are so much at the mercy of the, uh, you know, of the market today. Yeah. And I always tell people, I say, you know what? If someone's taking the steps to put Masteron into something or taking these steps to put trend balloon in something more than likely and I'm sure there's this exception They're probably dosing it close to right because they don't want people to not get any response from it. So Most it, once you identify your steroid as being the right steroid you, You're probably pretty good on on what you're using in terms of the gear you're using because like I said No one's gonna sell a product that has nothing in it because no one's gonna use it after after they get no results from it yeah, exactly. The real, the real value to a counterfeiter is to be able to put something really cheap in the product and have your customer not know that you've substituted it and keep the return, the repeat business coming back and you just, it's just margins, margins on, on yeah. you know, on that kind of practice. Yeah. So, um, I yeah. agree. All right, let's talk about the third topic I wanted to bring up, which is something that you've been working tons of research into. I know you've been working on this product for years. You've had it out for years. Um, I find it a very interesting, you know, uh, product. I don't really know what the benefits, but you have a lot of research that you you want to uh, relay. It's called arachidonic acid. Uh, the, the product is called X Factor, and what arachidonic acid is is it's an essential fatty acid in the omega six family. Um, there's two there's two essentials there. There's the GLA gamma acid, and then there's the arachidonic acid. I am always a big advocate of the GLA uh, because. I always was under the belief that we get a lot of arachidonic acid already from the foods we eat, chicken, meat, eggs, and you know, and, and most of this information I have is garnished through Steve Blackman at MD, because him and I have discussed this ad infinitum, especially when I worked there. Um, explain to us why you need extra arachidonic acid if you are not a vegetarian. Sure. Um, well, the first thing, well, first, before I even get into it, I, I want to preface that I want to say, I work on a lot of things, um, probably most, as you said, probably uh, most well known for the book. Um, we've got Roy Tess, we've got, I got a tech company. I've got a lot of creative projects going on. Arachidonic acid is my legacy. It's my legacy to this industry. It's the work that I believe I'm going to be remembered for after the book has been redone by somebody else after molecular has been sold off and you know replaced by another company, I believe arachidonic acid is gonna be the compelling piece of work um, that I'm remembered for, if I am remembered, if I'm lucky enough to be remembered. <laughs> Let me explain, and, and yes, this, this is the most important thing to me. I probably wouldn't even have uh, a company in sports nutrition anymore if it wasn't for arachidonic acid. This is the only reason I'm still in this industry. Frankly, I fucking hate the sports nutrition industry, <laughs> this aside. Um, ARA is, when, we, when you work out, ARA is one of the first things that's gonna dictate how you grow. Let me explain. And I could get, I can get very technical. I'm gonna to try to, to really simplify things. And, and Dave, it's not for your benefit, it's uh, you know, for the benefit of, sure. of, of the viewers. I know you, you know this in a lot more detail. So um, I liken uh, ARA to, to like fix a flat on a tire. What it does is it's richly stored, ARA is, the two richest place for, places for ARA in your body are your brain and your muscles. Very richly stored, very abundant on your muscle phospholipids. So now, what is weight training? 
wait, you know, of course it is damage. We're trying to inflict damage on our muscles so our muscles are forced to repair themselves and get bigger and stronger in the process. Well, this is where ARA comes in right in the beginning of the process when you are lifting weights. You damage your, your you disturb the fibers, the membranes get disrupted. The fatty acids starts getting, start getting cleaved off of the membrane. Now, these get converted, some, many are inert, some of them get converted to different substances. ARA gets converted to prostaglandins, which very quickly, very locally acting, start to initiate the process of, of muscle repair. It is linked to inflammation, but what is, it is, ARA is what your body uses to, um, to largely mitigate inflammation, to direct it, to, um, to spark it and to diminish it in many regards. Um, but that's what inflammation is. It is healing. So the first thing when people say, oh, well, ARA is inflammatory, uh, I would say, well, systemically, no. Locally, yes. But what the fuck are you doing when you're trying to look, when, you, when you're working out? You're trying to damage your muscles. You're trying to initiate inflammation. Well, guess what? How much arachidonic acid you have on that muscle cell membrane is going to dictate how much prostaglandin gets released and how strong that anabolic signaling is. And another thing, your diet and your level of activity are going to strongly dictate what happens to your muscle membranes. They don't just have a set level of ARA in them. These things fluctuate constantly. You take a lot of fish oil, um, you don't take a lot of animal products, you're going to have lower levels of ARA in your membrane. Right. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to have a harder time triggering growth. ARA, and it's another one of the reasons why when we first get into, the, into training, we get really sore and our workouts are really productive. It's because our stores of our, I mean, there's a lot of neurological issues and stuff going on there too as well that make them productive and strength productive, but ARA is abundant. It's getting liberated. We're getting really sore. And then over time, we train, we train, we train. We keep doing the same thing over and over to the same muscle fibers. The fatty acids start changing. ARA starts getting replaced by more abundant fatty acids in our diet. And slowly but surely, we have a harder time triggering soreness. We have a hard time, harder time triggering growth. ARA is is at the very root of of, of this process. So is that why <laughs> is that why when I ate McDonald's every day, I grew so much? You know what? <laughs> it may have something to do with it. People used to say, old, you know, old school bodybuilders eat red meat, fuck chicken. I mean, it's it's good protein source, yeah. but they would always say. Don't ignore your beef. Don't ignore your red meat. That's really important for muscle growth. Well, well, when creatine came out, people started saying, well, it's creatine. It's the creatine that's in meat. Well, no, it's really not because you don't get that much creatine in meat that you're loading creatine. Right. It's possibly, or my contention would be, it would be the rich arachidonic acid stores in red meat. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, the average person takes about 200 to 250 milligrams a day of ARA in the diet, and that's the average Western diet that's rich in animal products. We've seen in clinical studies the, you know, the most effective benefits, uh, you know, that we've seen in the studies, gram to a gram and a half a day. So it's considerably higher than the average dietary intake, mm -hmm. which is why, uh, you know, when I heard that you had said that you don't need extra ARA, I said, well, wait a minute, how many people do you know that are taking a gram to a gram and a half a day? And the other fatty acids, even though like LA is, um, linoleic acid is your, considered your, um, your essential omega-6, it's, it's only essential really because it converts to ARA, which is the biologically essential omega-6. Right. Sure. Um, but you, it, it's not good for enriching tissue stores of ARA. It's good for meeting your basic needs, but higher levels really don't enrich your, fi your muscle fibers with ARA. All right, so. let me ask you a question now. You said the average American gets about 200 milligrams of ARA per day. Um, yeah. Bodybuilders are not the average American. We, we eat you know, nope. six, eight, 10 times a day. A lot of meats and chickens and eggs. Um, would you say that the average bodybuilder has probably has a much higher average ARA intake already from food? Yeah, I would definitely think so. But you know, let's just look at the numbers. So let's say, what's the average diet? Twenty five hundred calories a day or so, give or take. Yeah. Um, let's say you double that. You're at five thousand calories a day. Right. If your intake is two hundred, I mean, it, you have to look at everybody's diet. Right. Individually, of course. Sure. But let's just say to do some rough numbers. You know, let's say 200. Well, I are on the higher side. 250 milligrams a day. You double your your food intake. Now you're at 500 milligrams a day. That's definitely a good benefit. But we've seen really good effects at a gram to a gram and a half a day. I don't think most people 
are meeting that um, with diet. And I'm certainly not suggesting that people should take that constantly. The way we recommend that ARA is taken is you supplement it once or twice a year when you're stuck in a plateau, when you're not making progress. Go on a gram, gram and a half a day, use it for eight weeks, and more than likely, you're gonna start making progress again. You're gonna notice soreness again. You know, I get frustrated sometimes over this because this is so important to muscle growth. It's so fundamental, and it's hard to get people to look at a new ingredient. Well, and we funded two clinical studies on it, and both of them, both of them showed, in some regards, very similar, but both of them showed significant performance-enhancing effects. In the second one, we have lean mass, strength, power, everything. We swept it across the board, was effective. So, and then, you know, when you brought up muscle media, you brought up something interesting, was that I have a lot, you know, to me, that was like the golden age of our industry. Because that was a time when you could come up with an innovative ingredient and the industry would, in many regards, not everybody, you know, people are, a lot of people are dicks and they'll always be like that, but the industry would rally around an interesting ingredient and people would really get excited and take an interest in it. And that's not the way it is today. Our, you know, there's a lot of big money in, in, in this field, a lot of big companies, a lot of, a lot of big companies spending big money with you know, with the universities and with the scientific organizations, and they're not going out of their way to embrace and fund research into into new ingredients. They've, you know, they've got their own thing going on. So it's interesting. It's an interesting time. Well, you know, I'm a big believer in essential fatty acid. No one is a, is a champion champion of essential fatty acid intake than me. I mean, I I probably talk about it, you know, a hundred times a week. You know, on between my radio shows, TV shows. So I'm, I, you got me, I, you don't have to sell me on that. I'm a believer and I know that arachidonic acid is one of the essential byproducts. Uh, you know, just to clarify for people, there's two families of essential fatty acids, which also fall, they're also known as the polyunsaturated fats, the omega-3s. And we know that the parent omega-3 compound doesn't really readily convert to the intermediates very efficiently. That's why taking DHA, EPA, usually in the form of some kind of fish oil uh, supplement is, is, is ideal to do. Then you, on the omega-6 side of things, you have your GLA, uh, which are your intermediates, and then your, and your ARA, or arachidonic acid. So you got the two intermediates over there. Most people just worry about the GLA. I've always been the kind of guy that advocated just GLA. Don't worry about arachidonic because I think you get enough in the foods. You're telling me that I'm wrong, and you know what? I'm the first person to say, I don't know, so I could be wrong. So it would be interesting to see... I'd like to see some bodybuilders out there who are stuck in plateaus. I know a lot of guys watch these shows. They probably watch the show 400 times because it's, it, we put out so much, so much good information. I'd like to see them, them try it. And you're saying they should do how much? 1,000 milligrams a day? 1,000 to uh, 1,500. Okay. Now, I noticed your formula. Johnny had it up on the screen before. You have some uh, omega-3s in there, and you also have some Boswellia. What, what, now, Boswellia is, is a known anti-inflammatory. Why did you put Boswellia in there? We have two versions. We have the original X Factor, which is just pure ARA. It's out of stock right now. We have, okay. we have a hard time sometimes keeping that one in stock. Um, the advanced formula, that's more of like, I'd consider our well-rounded uh, formula. We use that in it because some people complain about the soreness, complain about the joint issues with it. And we tried to make a version that was a little more comfortable, that kind of addressed some of those secondary issues. But you're saying um, that's good. You want to be sore, you're telling me. Right? What's that? You're saying it's good to be sore. It's good to, that that means that you're growing from a It is absolutely it is. Uh, I was more thinking like you know, for some people, ARA the X factor felt like a bit too much. Their joints are bothering them, and we kind of added the you know kind of formulated it out to make it a little more comfortable. And I would say the omega three. There's there's some evidence that it's a little bit can be complementary. Um, I would say it was partly that and partly sending a message that. Um, it isn't one or the other. They're both very important fatty acids. They right. both uh, play uh, key roles in the body. Um, so it's not that you have to exclude omega-3s. You could take them both together even and, and, and get a decent benefit out of it. But um, but yeah, but you know, they, the pure the pure ARA product is the one that the studies were, were done on. Gotcha. All right, well, it's very interesting. I'm gonna probably talk to you off camera about you know formulating a product for uh, my species nutrition line. Uh, because I, I, I look, I, I'm always learning, you know, and I'm not, 
I don't know that I didn't know that much about arachidonic. I didn't realize that the studies really did show that you do need more. And I, and I agree with you because if even in a bodybuilder's diet that's eating a ton of red meat, you're probably still not getting 1,200 milligrams of arachidonic acid a day. So every bodybuilder wants to maximize their gains. And I know if I was still out there in the field trying to be the biggest guy out there, I certainly would try it. It's an easy, it's, it makes sense logically. We know what it, 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 that it's required in the diet. So it, it can't really hurt at this point to add it into the program. Now, would you recommend that people who have heart disease or any problems like that take this product? No. See, um, the, the oversimplification is that ARA is inflammatory. The, the reality is, is ARA itself is not pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory. It's, it's just a fatty acid that your body will modify when needed to do certain things. So with weightlifting, you know, when it's abundantly stored in your muscle tissues, um, you, get, you get more liberated during your workouts, you get more localized inflammation. So you get more soreness in your muscles and stuff. Systemic, systemic markers of inflammation actually are reduced in athletes that take ARA, which is a, another side, side issue, is that it actually seems to lower systemic inflammation with exercise. Um, but if you are somebody that has a, a disease state that is um, affected by inflammation, as any to any of the uh, you know many inflammatory related diseases in that case your body may be utilizing the ARA to promote inflammation that's what it uses it for when it needs it and it you know that may be what's happening so if you have an inflammatory condition in your body no don't take it okay. um, healthy sedentary people it's been extensively studied they put it in baby formula so before they did that they did a lot of uh, metabolic studies on uh, normal healthy adults no change in inflammation no change in any health markers um, that we have ever come across. Um, so it seems pretty inert from, you know, a sedentary person taking it. Um, but again, if you have an inflammatory disease, don't. Um, and athletes may notice, you know, a reduction in inflammation with it. So, And I want to say this, too. Dave, you've known me for a long time. I've been in this industry 20 years now or something like that. Um, I put ingredients out. I, I put research out, books. I am not suggesting that anybody take my word for it, for it, that ARA works. However, I do think there is, um, there is some consider the source. And I think I have a track record in this industry of not being full of fucking shit, okay? <laughs> and this is my life's work. I'm somebody here that's telling you, I've worked in this industry for 20 years. This is the most compelling, most interesting, most exciting thing that I've ever worked on. So I would hope that some people would would take that, at least take the time to read the two, the six figures in in clinical studies that my company has funded on the ingredient to validate exactly what we've been right. saying. Right. Well, it sounds compelling to me. I I, I like it. I'm gonna, we're going to talk about it a little more off camera. Like I said, I have one final question because I thought this interview went really well. I know the fans are going to love it. How many books would you say you sold? How many anabolics books have you sold over the last, you know, whatever, 17 years? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't want to put the figure out there. It might, uh, might prompt too many people to try to compete with me. Thousands? The book, 10, right. 10,000? 10,000? 10,000? You know, um, we've, we print that frequently, and I've, I've, done, I've done a lot of editions. Really? Wow. Okay. Well, it, it, it might be one of the most popular, all-time popular best-selling anabolics books of all time, I would have to assume at this point. And I believe it is. When, when it first came out, we were at, I think it was like, it was like a 102 or 112 on Amazon's bestseller list for all of their books. Wow. I was right behind um, this guy, I think his name was Sonny, he wrote a book about the Hells Angels. <laughs> I was right behind him on the, uh, on the bestseller list. That I was pretty... Pretty impressed with for a sports book. It does okay. I mean, hey, I'm you know I'm not driving a Lambo and uh, and floating on a yacht, but um, you keeps me uh, you know it keeps me keeps a roof over my head and, uh, and it keeps me going. Yeah. Keeps me working on other projects, man. Bill, will we ever see a, a growth hormone testing kit? That's the question I get asked the most. I'd love to. I don't think so because you know it's such a fragile protein. And these are, you know, these reagents are acids, you know, so they break things down. And uh, I, I can't say that it's not possible. Well, they got um, a pregnancy test to test for HCG. Why can't we test for GH? 
Yeah, it would have to be something more along the lines of that. It, it couldn't be a reagent based test. It would have to be like an you know assay or some kind of yeah. um, you know some kind of test along those lines. I think that um, possible, possible, anything's possible. Um, but I think developing that would take a lot of resources. You love doing that though, Bill. I hate doing that kind of stuff. I like to just sell it you know after what? it's done. I do, Dave, but to be completely honest with you, um, you know, I'm in sports nutrition just to see my work and with ARA continue to, to grow. Super pumped about Roy Test. I think that's gonna, the sky's the limit with that. I'm real passionate about my tech business right now. I've got that going on and if I'm pouring a lot of resources into something right now, it's probably that. So what are you doing with it? What's your tech uh, business you got going on? Um, yeah, the past several years and everybody in this industry has just been fighting and bitching about the market. Um, I've been acquiring really key assets in the, in the, in the domain sector. Mm -hmm. So we've, we're sitting on some really cool domain names to build out, um, which we're doing slowly now. So uh, we're building out some, some new businesses. That's, I'll say that. All right. You'll keep us updated, I'm sure, once they're ready to go. Yep. Are they related well, to the bodybuilding field or no? No, no, sir. Wow. So you must have a new passion then. You know, com I've always been passionate about computers. I was, that's sort of how I got into, into gear. I was a 16 year old computer nerd. I got arrested for phone hacking, phone freaking. <laughs> um, it was kind of a lifestyle change because my phones were monitored and stuff for a while. I couldn't do what I was passionate about and I, I kind of shifted interests yeah. and got into bodybuilding and, you know, and weightlifting. But I always had that computer thing and uh, you know, I'm kind of back on that right now. I, I, what I'm really passionate about, what I'm most passionate about is that most business owners don't understand the power of a good domain name yet. Most don't. Right. I see every day people launching businesses in our industry and our industry is one of the worst for it. Yeah. People every day launching businesses with hyphenated domain names, dot nets, dot me. Right. Uh, they don't get the the authority um, and how much the right domain name can um, improve your advertising costs, um, decrease your cost per click, increase your conversion rates just by having an authoritative domain name that says, "Hey, you know, we're a real established company." Yeah, well, I, I I'm into reptile breeding now. That's my new passion. And there's a, a a guy I'm friends with, Jeremy Stone, has the name BoaConstrictor.com. How much that better can you be at selling boa constrictors than having that name? You know. That's category defining. If I was yeah. looking for a boa constrictor breeder, right? right, and I'm searching Google and I see that, I'm automatically going yeah. to assume that this person is one of the big ones. I mean, right. how else does he have boaconstrictor.com? Right. 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 Um, we own, I have a bunch of good ones, um, but I'll give you a, a good category defining one that we own, uh, concealedcarry.org. Oh, wow. Concealed carry is a huge program. I normally invest in .coms. I love this for .org. Um, because it's like a it's a social issue. It's um, it's political, right? And it's category defining. I, we've already been contacted, and it's funny. Before uh, I got on with you, I, I had a follow somebody else a follow up from one of these people uh, from one of the big multi million dollar companies wants to buy it from us, but we're we're going to build it out. But uh, yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah. Well, Bill, I want to thank you for coming on. I want to thank you for talking to us about the new book that's coming out. And where is that? Where can people buy the new Anabolics book? You. Me? Oh, that's right. I'm going to sell it. I forgot. We, we, yeah, you're right. DavePalumbo.com. So. You'll get the new out. Anabolics book. When is it going to be out? Um, probably right now I'm working on the printing. I'm trying to get it done full color for the first time. So all the pages are full color. Wow. If I do that, it's going to take a couple of months, uh, you know, sea freight transit. It's not going to cost so, like a thousand dollars, is it? With the color pictures? Uh, you know what? Printing costs are comparable if you're willing to go offshore. Okay. I can get a black and white done for the same price as a color. Wow. Uh, but the black and white would be here and the color would be offshore. So that's where we're at right now. I'd really like to bring it to color for the yeah, first time. I think it would be great. I think it would yeah. be absolutely great. All right. Well, the Anabolics book will be available at DavePalumbo.com as well as Roy Test. You can get that right now at DavePalumbo.com. And of course, X Factor is Bill uh, Llewellyn's amazing arachidonic acid product and uh, like I said you can check that out and add it to your regimen and see if you do indeed add more muscle because uh, the research seems to indicate that and I'm intrigued by it and we're gonna you know follow up with Bill in coming months uh, as more stuff comes out about it so Bill thank you so much good luck with all your tech stuff you got going on and uh, 
keep the uh, go get that growth hormone test made. I think we need it. <laughs> I'll, I'll certainly work on it, and the semi quantitative too on the uh, the gear that's still in the work. So hopefully right. we'll see. Keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to take us to the end of another episode of Live with, brought to you by Yamamoto Nutrition. I'm Dave Palumbo, and we'll see you next time.